All right. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us uh, again. Hope everybody's staying safe and healthy during these times. Uh, it's exciting to see you all again. Uh, my name is Marcus Schweitzer. I'm the executive director for our Win the Era effort. Uh, we are uh, looking forward to having uh, the mayor talk with everybody tonight. We also have uh, a new format with our Zoom that we're going to try out, which is exciting. So we have some folks ready to ask questions. So uh, excited about this new format. But Mayor, I'll kick it over to you. All right. Well, thanks, Marcus. And, and thanks to everybody on the Win the Era team for uh, continuing to help uh, bring this wonderful community of supporters together. I'm thrilled with how many people are joining us tonight. And uh, uh, likewise, hope that you are keeping safe and uh, that you're doing all right, uh, both health-wise and, and given everything that uh, has disrupted all of our lives. Uh, I'm uh, uh, doing well here in South Bend. Uh, Chas and I are continuing to uh, work from uh, home here on a number of different efforts, uh, some of which we'll, we'll get a chance to, to talk about tonight. Uh, and South Bend seems to be uh, holding up pretty well, although there have been some hot spots uh, emerging here in, uh, uh, in our part of Indiana, unfortunately. Uh, you know, the biggest thing I think that we need to keep track of in terms of the pandemic response is the extent to which we're seeing uh, a lot of urgency around getting back on our feet, but not a lot of clarity about how to do it. If you think about it, when this was first uh, requiring leaders to respond, the decision was was binary. It was either shut down or not, and shut down pretty much pretty much meant shut down just about everything. Reopening is a lot more complicated than that because reopening is something that happens one piece at a time. And if, for example, somebody's job gets reopened but their kid's school doesn't, uh, it creates incredible challenges and difficulties. And so I think right now the question, despite what you might see from a handful of lunatics on state house lawns uh, demanding that we ignore all, all public health advice. The, the real question right now is not between completely reopening and completely staying shut down forever. It's about how we can safely reopen, which means a lot more testing and tracing, like we talked about last week. And it means making sure that to the extent there are steps uh, toward reopening, that they happen in a way that actually takes care of uh, uh, those who are most vulnerable. The other thing that I think we need to be paying a lot of attention to, especially for folks who are paying uh, this kind of attention to the political process and the policy process out there, is the fact that it's not possible and it's not desirable to just go back to normal. And I, I think sometimes the assumption in some of the conversations happening out there is, uh, well, once we get through this moment, we would go back to what we had before. But first of all, it's not possible because the, this will change some things in our economy and in our lives forever. The other thing, the question I think we need to be asking ourselves is, uh, would we want to go back to what we had before with the same weaknesses and the same winners and losers? I think the answer is a pretty clear no. And that means the question of how we're going to emerge from this pandemic is nothing less than also the question of what the future of our political and economic and social arrangements are going to be and how we can be a more resilient and robust country. Uh, that's going to require a lot of us, uh, especially the kinds of people who I think were attracted to our campaign. Because, of course, our whole message was about thinking not one election at a time, but about the era to come. And it's one more reason why it's so important to me that we stay in touch, this community of people who share the same sense of urgency and the same broad values. This is also connected to the Win the Era PAC effort, which I know uh, many of you have, have been so kind to support already. Uh, you can do so through winthera.com. And this is about making sure that we are supporting leaders and causes who we think reflect that focus on the long term and that readiness to ask the biggest, most fundamental questions and, and come up with answers, new answers, uh, that are going to work for us. And I'm pleased to tell you that we are within days of announcing the first round of candidates, active candidates in races right now that uh, I'm planning to support and that we'll ask uh, through Win the Era for, for you to consider supporting as well. So I'm excited about that because there are so many good leaders. We, of course, won't be able to name all of them, uh, but we will be able to uh, support a number of them in a way that I think uh, conveys what, uh, what, what this uh, amazing force that we all represent is all about. Uh, we're looking for candidates who have, have focus on the long term, who represent the interests of the new generation, either belonging to that new generation or uh, no matter uh, what generation they belong to, uh, focusing in, in the work they do on issues, on questions of long term economic 
uh, and racial fairness and equality, climate change, the structure of our democracy and other things that are going to decide whether the rest of this century goes well for America. We're looking for people who are pioneering and sometimes cutting against the grain in the areas where they're running. And people are going to make a big difference, uh, either continuing their work or, uh, in some cases, uh, for the very first time, stepping into the offices they're running for. So I'm really excited to share that with you. I know some of you have heard about this before, but some are uh, on a call f- uh, for the first time. And uh, watch this space, because I'm really excited about what we're going to be able to do together. Uh, but having given that uh, a little bit of an update, I, I want to move quickly to my favorite part of the call, especially with this New format, bear with us, because we're pioneering a way to uh, bring your voices into the conversation. And uh, I'm really excited to uh, uh, take up some of the questions and hear some of the ideas that you brought to us. Great. And as a, a point of the Zoom, uh, if you select speaker mode in the corner, it, uh, it'll probably pop to the face of the person speaking. So uh, if you're having you know, vis- any visibility issues, hit speaker mode in the corner uh, of, your, uh, of your screen. Uh, so with that, we have our, our first question. We want to turn it over to Jonathan Canfield from Virginia. Jonathan, you want to ask your question? Yeah. Um, hi, Pete. Uh, thank you for chatting with us today um, and just really running such an inspiring campaign. Um, I read your recent article in the Washington Post on U.S. competition with China, and I'm wondering, kind of building off of it, how do you think that we should strengthen and kind of improve um, our longstanding alliances and partnerships uh, around the world, really, as we move into this next era of American leadership? Yeah, it's a great question, Jonathan, and, and, and thanks for uh, noticing the op-ed, too, which I, I thought it was important to get out there because what we're seeing is the, the Trump administration, uh, or the Trump campaign, I should say, has adopted this uh, this political strategy of trying to say that the Democratic Party and, and Joe Biden in particular are, are going to be weak on China. Uh, and uh, as you saw, I, I actually believe that one of the uh, most uh, uh, detrimental things in terms of the, the strategic rivalry we have with China is if we were to have another term of the Trump administration with the polarization and the division uh, and, uh, and, and the dangers that have come from that. And there are a whole bunch of different pieces to that, including the, the administration's silence on human rights abuses, whether it's Hong Kong or Xinjiang. Uh, but a big part of it has to do with alliances, which is what, what your question is about. Look, our alliances have never been more important. And uh, if we're trying to see to a, a, a complex world that we're moving, we're moving into, uh, I think of it, first of all, on the threat side, right? So what are the big threats coming up? There continue to be conventional military threats and, and, and terrorism issues like what I worked on in the military, but also talking about election security issues. We're talking about global health security issues like what we're living through right now. And we're talking about climate security. All of those can only be addressed if there's international cooperation. And let me mention something else that, that uh, I think we need to begin thinking about. And there's just now starting to be some, some coverage of this. You know, there's an assumption out there that when they invent the vaccine, uh, that's the day our problems are solved with this pandemic, right? Getting that vaccine distributed uh, and, and getting it out to uh, 10 billion people, that's not a small thing. And that's an area, too, where in order to quickly and fairly get that vaccine out, the relationships among countries are going to be critically important. So it's just one more example of that. So dealing with threats, but also creating opportunities. Uh, at a time when we, we see more economic opportunity than, than ever in, in our kind of technological capabilities, if we manage in the right way. It, it, in all of that, it's going to be critically important for us to, uh, to have our allies uh, and to, to strengthen those alliances. And, you know, I think about some of the people I served with when I was deployed, it, it would be hard to look someone in the eye right now with the things that are going on in, uh, in, in this administration and, and the loss of American moral authority. I tweeted earlier today, uh, Chinese state news media took advantage of uh, the fact that uh, Dr. Fauci was prevented from testifying in Congress in a way, I think, to, to create a kind of equivalency between what's going on in this administration and some of their own internal, uh, uh, of, of course, at a different level, but, but, but their own uh, kind of internal issues. And using that for these countries that are kind of deciding where to place their bets. We want to make sure that any country deciding where to uh, align themselves uh, still wants to, to be associated with the United States. The good news is I don't think it's too late. I think we have an opportunity through good faith partnership, through work on the things that everybody knows are going to be a problem, like climate, uh, and through renewed diplomacy that can be led, I, I think, by uh, empowering a new generation of, of uh, foreign service uh, 
and, and, and related professionals to, to really build that up. Uh, you know, we're going to need a, a new call to service that motivates a generation of people, whether it's literally as a State Department employee or more broad in service abroad or, or, or in different capacities, to be that face of the country. The, the face of the country should never be the president alone. <laughs> Definitely not this president. But no president should rely alone on uh, on their own presence to, uh, to to kind of represent us. And in addition to being excited about the idea that I think uh, someone as credible as, as Vice President Biden can help reset a lot of our relationships, I'm also really excited about what uh, more of us can do to be involved formally and informally uh, to build those alliances up. So uh, I think you're right to pay attention to that. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very worried, but also uh, not without some level of optimism that we can write that shit. Thanks for the question. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, our next question comes from Carrie in Indiana. Carrie, tell us where you're from and ask your question. Hello, hello, Pete. Uh, my name is Carrie. I'm down in uh, Evansville, Indiana, and I'm currently at right. Clean for School. Got that students for Pete Button. Awesome. Uh, I miss hello. Evansville. I had a great time uh, when I visited uh, uh, your, your community many times during uh, during my first campaign. So make sure to bring my greetings to people around town. Yeah, we'd love it if you came back. I uh, hope we get to. Uh, anyways, how do you think mid-sized cities such as Evansville and South Bend uh, gradually reopen? I'm sure you've read Governor Holcomb's plan. I'm a little skeptical of it, but I just want your opinion on it. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little skeptical too. You know, if you asked me a few days ago, I, I would have been giving the governor pretty high marks for having acted quickly, at least as Republican governors go, to uh, uh, to make sure that, that we got the kind of uh, uh, action to, to uh, shelter in place. Um, but what we're seeing now as of last Friday is they released a plan. It's got a lot of pieces to it. Uh, it's, I think, a little bit confusing. And it's not clear how those pieces are connected or flexible to the, uh, to the facts on the ground. Uh, if I want to uh, look on the bright side, I would say that the worst thing a governor can do is disempower mayors. So we're seeing that in places like Georgia, where mayors aren't even allowed to set standards for the city. Uh, they go further than the state. Here in Indiana, the governor is saying, well, mayors can, can and cities can, can do whatever. So I guess that's a, a silver lining, but it also feels like there's this punting going on, right? The president's punting to the states, and in our state, the governor is punting to the communities. And what it leads to, I don't know how, how it's uh, going in, in the area around Evansville, but certainly here in South Bend, what we're seeing is uh, uh, in our sort of twin uh, cities, for example, with us in the community right next to us, uh, Mayor Mueller here in South Bend, I think, is doing a great job really uh, making sure that, that we're uh, uh, safety first. Uh, but there's a different message coming from the mayor of the next town over. Uh, and it's not clear uh, how much authority the county holds. Has. This is exactly why national leadership matters. I mean, I've, I've always been a guy out there preaching the importance of the law, right? Um, but having some kind of consistent message coming from, from the White House uh, that, that then flows out through the states, at least by way of setting some standards and some principles and some guidelines, that's really important when we don't have that. So for mid-sized communities like ours, I think a lot of it's going to rely on the informal authority uh, of uh, trusted community leaders. Often that can be a mayor. Uh, sometimes that's uh, that's somebody who's not even in government, uh, in, in the social sector or, or in public health. Uh, but I think, it, unfortunately, it's left to us to sort out who the most credible voices are and, and then uh, try to respond to, to what they have to say. I mean, we, we deserve better, but, but this is what it's going to come down to. I do think that, that uh, one thing that might happen for smaller and mid-sized communities like ours is in the long run, they start to look more attractive uh, as people uh, look for, for places that, uh, uh, that, that they're going to find or, or kind of consistent with a, uh, a future where maybe we're not as focused on being packed into the particular geography where uh, office buildings are, for example, right? A, a much more flexible uh, relationship to, to work. Again, I'm trying to look on the bright side here uh, and, and, and see some benefits for our communities, but it's going to be tough anywhere you go. Uh, and that's all the more reason for, for us to be involved. So I'm, I'm excited to hear that you're uh, disengaged already and, and hope that you, you stay on that path. Great. Thanks so much, Gary. Uh, our next question comes from Barbara Jansen from Oregon. Bar Barbara, tell us where in Oregon you are and ask your question. Yeah, I'm in Albany, Oregon, which is about an hour from Portland. And um, I wanted to let you know that volunteering for your campaign was one of the most meaningful things that I've done. And so uh, my question is that I'm excited about um, finding out who you have chosen so far to support. 
And in addition to donating to their campaigns, what will be the best ways that you feel that we'll be able to support them? Terrific. So uh, uh, first of all, thanks for being involved in my campaign. I'm, I'm so glad to hear that it was rewarding. And thanks for staying involved as we undertake uh, this new effort. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the, simple, the short answer is stay tuned. We're, uh, uh, we're, we're uh, going uh, now through, through names. And uh, uh, part of what makes it hard is there's so many great deserving candidates and campaigns out there, but uh, we're going to be able soon to present you, our, our community of supporters, with a roster of, of people that uh, I think uh, you're going to find really exciting. And uh, and then uh, the, the the race is on, I mean, if you think about it, we're more or less exactly six months from election day. Uh, and so uh, there's not a lot of time to, to make sure we're there for them. And of course, it's primary season for a lot of states too. Um, in addition to financially contributing, a lot of it's spreading the word. One of the things I love about our community of supporters is how nationally connected we are. And so if there's somebody running a certain state, uh, maybe it's not close to you, but you know somebody who is, uh, helping just to get on their radar matters. So does social media amplification. We've got such an active uh, group of folks uh, on this call who uh, really take to, uh, uh, in a way that's maybe a little more positive and constructive <laughs> than the baseline on some of those social media networks. And you get out there and uh, I've seen how wonderful it was to have support and encouragement to, that you've offered me, uh, offering that to the people who are on our list, that's going to be a big deal too. Uh, and the, the, the third thing I'll mention is that in addition to great candidates, we're also going to be trying to elevate great causes. Uh, I'll give you one example right now, something we talked about on the campaign that's only grown more important, and that's national service. So, you know, national service is something that uh, is, or at least I think ought to be, a bipartisan priority. Uh, it's also something that we now know is going to be a really essential part to dealing with the pandemic. For example, uh, I've been in touch with uh, researchers who are crunching the numbers on what it would take to really safely reopen uh, in, in a full way over the summer. And uh, they estimate, depending who you talk to, uh, between 100,000 and 200,000 people will be needed to help with the contact tracing. We're talking about a huge uh, number of people. Now, this is not completely unprecedented. Think about the fact, for example, that every 10 years, uh, America hires a huge number of census enumerators uh, to help make sure that the census gets them. Uh, but the best precedents we have for this, of course, are from service. Meanwhile, we've got a lot of AmeriCorps volunteers and Peace Corps volunteers who've been sidelined because of uh, uh, because of the pandemic, when actually we need to not only put them to work, but add to, to the number of people who can do it. Now, Congress could actually do this without new legislation. When they created uh, the, the entity, uh, I think it's called CNCS, the, the uh, basically, it's the, the, the agency and the government that, that helps uh, things like AmeriCorps, for example, work. Um, they created the, the plumbing, if you will, that actually, uh, if we just added more funding to it, could almost immediately go to work and put way more people into these service roles uh, in a way that I think would help us confront the problem and would help uh, would help the people who, who are part of it. Um, I actually see in the comments some folks who are uh, Peace Corps and AmeriCorps volunteers, which is awesome. So. Um, I guess my point is that's just one example of, of an issue that we as, as a community of people uh, speaking to representatives in, in our areas and, and just getting out there on the line if we can't be out there in person can help elevate, in addition to helping elevate the candidates, excuse me, the, the names that uh, I'm really excited to, uh, to unveil with these few days. Thank you, Barbara. Thanks so much for your support. Uh, and next, uh, Parker in New York. I think you have a question. Tell us, tell us where you are and ask away. Hey, Mayor Pete. Uh, I'm in upstate New York. Um, my question is, in our current polarized times, how do you see Democrats making inroads in traditionally Republican states? And I guess the follow-up, um, is it, do you see it through like what I'm calling the Steve Bullock model? Hmm. So uh, I, as a red state Democrat, this is something I consider really important. And again, you'll, you'll see this a little bit uh, uh, in the, the names of the campaigns that we identify through in the areas as examples of people uh, that we think will help us to do that. Okay, I think the model is going to be different in different geographies. But let me say this. I don't think it has to mean watering down our values. I think sometimes there's that temptation. Uh, and uh, as, of course, uh, you're going to see candidates who are uh, strong Democrats might also be more moderate in, in, uh, in some certain states. But I actually think this is a time to really be full throated in what we believe about the future uh, of our climate, uh, about the, the need to make sure that we have economic policies that, that lift up workers, that 
uh, are, are going to, to uh, help reinforce and build the, the racial and economic equality that, that, we, that we need. Because there's this moment that's forcing us to rethink everything. Doesn't mean you're going to reach everybody, right? I mean, again, uh, we're seeing some pretty shocking things in terms of uh, uh, folks showing up, uh, you know, at, at state capitals, for example, demanding the impossible. But we got to remember, actions like that always command outsized attention. If you really look at how most Americans are thinking, including in red states, a lot of Americans are ready for us to undertake big uh, steps forward that, that are going to make us better off. And I think that that creates a huge opportunity, certainly for retaking the Senate, uh, and more broadly for, for redefining politics in a lot of these so-called red states. I don't think there's such a thing as a permanently red state. I, I watched our home state of Indiana, which is as conservative as it gets, uh, vote for, for Barack Obama. It was the first time our state had voted for a Democrat in uh, I think 50 years since LBJ. Uh, and uh, it's still tough sledding here for Democrats, don't get me wrong, but it's an example of, uh, of the opportunity to, uh, uh, to, to surprise people. The last thing I would mention that I think is important in politics everywhere, but, but especially in, uh, in, in this question you're asking about making sure we make inroads in red states, we've got to make sure people understand what it is we're for and not just what we're against. Everybody knows what we think of Donald Trump. <laughs> And if, uh, if you haven't made up your mind about this president, but I, I, haven't, uh, uh, I haven't met anybody who, who uh, feels like the jury is out uh, one way or the other. Um, it's a powerful message uh, to talk about the, the terrible things that the president's doing, and we should, but that's not, that's not actually enough for a lot of people. And frankly, it should be. We're going to make sure people can picture how the country would be different under the leadership of the candidates we believe in. And presenting that positive vision, uh, presenting, it doesn't have to be an elaborate philosophy. It can be expressed in terms of values. It really can fit on the bumper stickers. Well, I always talked about freedom, democracy, and security in the campaign. We've got to make sure people can picture why the world we're trying to create is a little better. And when you do that, I find you can cut across a lot of the ideological lines and a lot of the partisan and tribal habits, especially in a moment like this, where things are so scrambled and things are, are, are so up in the air that a lot of folks are going to be ready to, uh, to reconsider some of their, their traditional vote patterns. Sorry, one last thing I'll mention. Um, let's remember that, that just how you approach people matters. One of the reasons we were able to do so well in Iowa, in counties that uh, had uh, swung in a pretty big way from supporting uh, President Obama to supporting Trump, was just the, the way that, that uh, some of the folks on this call treated people. Uh, and so in addition to the policy and the ideology, it's the tone and the approach is going to matter. And uh, we, we've uh, got a chance through leaders up and down the ticket uh, to send that message. It's what the rules of the road were about. It's what a lot of my favorite candidates are allowing, uh in ways that uh, go beyond anything that, that I've found words for during the presidential campaign. And when you see somebody like that, uh, whether it's a conservative corner of New York State or, or a place like Montana or a place like Indiana, it's amazing how far that can take you. Great. Thanks, Parker, for that question. Next is um, Robert in New York. Robert, I also caught a glimpse of you have a nice mug. I would love for you to show show the, the group your mug. <laughs> That's great. Uh, feel free to ask me a question. Thanks so much. Uh, you partially answered it. My original question was when you were going to start announcing the candidates you're supporting. So I'll change it. What's the process of selection? And are you cooperating with other groups either to concentrate support or to avoid duplication? Yeah, great question. So uh, first of all, uh, a lot of the people uh, uh, who, uh, actually, because I got to ask you to hold up the mug because you, you, you weren't up on the screen. I didn't get a peek at it. Let's, let's see what the, uh, ah, look at that. All right. Nice, stylish uh, coffee mug. Thanks for uh, continuing to, uh, uh, to, to fly the proverbial flag. So. Um, the process, first of all, came largely from, from uh, people in our network that we reached out to. We had our email that went out, people were on this call, uh, brought names toward our attention to candidates we're, we're really excited about. And uh, the, the real challenge then is kind of sifting through all of those ideas. Some people have approached us. Uh, people I got to know through the campaign, uh, members of Congress who, uh, uh, who we 
we've been in touch with or who are supportive, who uh, either themselves are in a tough race or uh, want to let us know about somebody who, who's on their radar. Uh, and so the, the intake was overwhelming. Then it was a question of really looking for a balance of candidates who are going to be able to collectively tell a story. So again, we're not going to be able to support every uh, candidate who deserves to be supported for the House or for the Senate. You name it. What we can do is create a spread of candidates who show the balance of things that we think are so important, making sure that we have that future vision, uh, electing more candidates of color, more LGBTQ candidates, more women uh, in offices where we have been seeing uh, that kind of representation. Uh, people who are a little bit against the grain, uh, I think, are especially exciting because it also reflects the ability to connect with people different from you. So uh, if there's a candidate who, by by way of their, uh, uh, maybe their age or their religion or their ethnicity, is a little bit different from their district, but uh, is doing well there, I think that's a sign of something really special, and, and we're, we're looking for that. And the answer to the other part of your question is absolutely. We are in touch uh, formally and informally with uh, different organizations that are pursuing the same goals. Uh, sometimes that means we can boost each other, uh, kind of reinforce a message about making sure some candidate gets, gets more attention and deserves it. Sometimes uh, we'll be able to say, okay, well, well some of our uh, allied organizations are, are, are supporting these candidates, so uh, let's we'll find somebody who's giving as much love. And you'll see uh, as, as we, again, we're still finalizing the names, but one thing I have to tell you, you'll see is, you know, you'll see uh, uh, some names of candidates that if you follow politics are very familiar and, 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 and very hot races. And my hope is uh, for just about everybody, you'll just see at least a couple names on there that you've never heard of in your life. And it'll prompt you to uh, learn more about them. Uh, we're in touch with the party, of course, uh, but also outside of the party, different organizations that uh, that, that we think uh, uh, really have that, that that same kind of overall goal. We think we have a different focus. And uh, I'm just so excited for what it's going to Okay. Thanks, Robert. We have time for one more question. Uh, Jaden, are you online? Jaden from Ohio. Let me unmute you. Hello, Mayor. How are you? Hi, Jaden. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm currently a sophomore right now in high school, and I would like to ask a question on the perspective. Uh, what is right now? All of us, all students, current graduates, are living in a time of confusion right now. Um, what advice would you give to current students and current graduates in this time of uncertainty? So it's a great question. And, and I think the most important thing I want you to be aware of in a moment like this is your own importance uh, as a generation coming of age at such a critical moment. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to pretend that this isn't tough. I get that it sucks uh, to uh, be a, a student uh, having your education disrupted, having uh, you know at a phase in your life when uh, your full time job is, is not just to learn everything you can about the world, but uh, socially to learn everything you can about yourself and and, and to have those experiences and, and for that to be interrupted. Um, there, there's no sugarcoating that, that, that that's incredibly difficult. Um, but the other side of the coin is that uh, for the rest of your life, uh, having come of age in this moment is going to shape you. And you collectively, people your age, and, uh, I, I like to think of myself as sort of young, I'd say people in my generation, are going to shape the moment. You know, it, it, it was not unusual for, for people my age to tell people my parents' age that we kind of envied them for living through the 60s. Because the 60s is this moment of upheaval, right? And it was exciting. It's scary and edgy and complicated. And in a way, uh, one of the things that they would say to me when I said things like that was that uh, in the moment it was actually tough, it was awful, it was, it was scary. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, the, all, all of that, there's a lot of heartbreak in, in, in the, the, the tension and the dynamism of that moment. Um, and so I think it'll probably be similar when, when you're explaining to your grandkids or kids what, what it was like to be there for this moment. Um, that uh, the history was happening around you, and that made it really tough and scary at the time, but also think about what that means, right? Uh, this is not just another turn of the wheel. Uh, the, the way our society and our country figures out how to move on from this moment is this asking that question, how are we going to get out of this, is asking the question of what our political and social and economic arrangements are going to be for the next 50 years, because what we're about to think up and, and and we better get it right. 
this is going to shape the, the, the whole future, I think, for as long as you and I are alive. So it may not be much consolation when you, when you just want to point your life back. But think about the fact that, that uh, because you're alive, because you're coming of age in this moment, it's going to matter so much uh, what you do, what you choose to care about, what you get involved in, uh, in terms of your advocacy and activism, what you wind up getting, choosing to get involved in, in, in terms of your studies and then in terms of your profession. It's going to matter because we have the good and bad fortune of living in one of those moments that history will report uh, in, in terms of how it, it shapes uh, uh, what's next. Uh, so that kind of impact is, is something that, that, that hopefully you find motivating uh, and, and that, that uh, kind of takes the edge off the, the, uh, the just the pain and the frustration that, that I know comes uh, with, uh, uh, with being at a, at a tender age, at a tender moment in the life of our country. It's a great question. Thanks so much, Jaden. Uh, and before before we wrap, Robert, there has been a request one more time to show the mug to the group. Every people are going wild in the chance for it, so pull it, put it. There we go. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everybody for uh, taking the time to join us today. Uh, Mayor, I'll kick it back over to you for uh, for closing remarks. Great. Well, thanks thanks for uh, uh, the great questions and, and thanks for taking the time together. And, and uh, I hope that, that you continue to stay safe. I hope that uh, you're lifting one another up too. Uh, if you got to know somebody through the campaign uh, and you haven't been in touch with them uh, for a while, now's a great time to reach out and, and, and just see how they're doing. Uh, and again, I'm really excited for where we're headed with the uh, Whitney ERF. And we'll continue sharing that with you. Uh, and thanks for, uh, for being part of that uh, with any kind of support, uh, financial, uh, moral or, uh, or or advocacy uh, that you've offered for that. Um, more than anything, I, I just want you to know how much uh, I, I love this group of, uh, of supporters in this community that we built. And um, uh, kind of uh, thinking about that last question, which is such a good one to reflect on, I think for all of us, uh, we have this moment where uh, it, it's, uh, it's tough to live through what we're living through, but it also means that what we decide to get involved in, where we decide to apply our energy, even more than we would have said three months ago, uh, the stakes could be higher. And hopefully that means one day that uh, it will be uh, exceptionally rewarding, uh, as well as having been exceptionally urgent to be in the arena at a time like this. Uh, thank you. Stay safe. And I hope I get to talk to you guys soon. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.